Hi everyone, welcome back. Michael Sandler here, best-selling author and your host on Inspire Nation. Check out our website where you'll find podcasts, tips, videos, blogs, and more at inspirenationshow.com. Today we have a very Australopithic guest on our show. His name is John Durant. He's been called a professional caveman, though I guess that'd be more of a Neanderthal. John Durant is an author, entrepreneur, venture investor, and yes, modern caveman. His first book, The Paleo Manifesto, advocates using our evolutionary history to combat the global epidemic of chronic health problems. He's been featured in the New York Times, The New Yorker, NPR Morning Edition, CBC, Der Spiegel, and The Colbert Report. He's spoken at Google, Harvard, The Nantucket Project, and has been rated one of the 100 most influential people in health and fitness by greatest. He's also the founder of Wild Ventures, a venture group specializing in consumer health products and technology, something I hope we'll get into on the show. Prior to becoming a professional caveman, he studied evolutionary psychology at Harvard. He thinks you should try a polar bear swim, chuck, intermittent fasting, chuck, and bone marrow. Yes, check too. For myself personally, I've been going down this caveman road for years without realizing it. I wrote best-selling books on barefoot running, barefoot walking, and connecting with the earth, and still go barefoot wherever I can, even in the snow. I'll also jump in freezing water no matter the temperature. You'll find me shirtless in the city, and I'm always asking, what would ancient caveman have done? I call myself a tinkerer, or what John would call a hacker, or a biohacker, continuously asking questions and experimenting on myself. One area I'm fascinated with is diet. For myself, I've been nearly a lifelong vegan or vegetarian until recently. For the last four, uh, three and a half years, I was even a fully raw vegan. But at that point, I was getting fracture after fracture, something strange as a former professional athlete, till I had my bone density tested and found it through the floor. Fortunately, at the time, I had this very strong calling to eat differently and had been drawn to the benefits of bone broth. Since then, I've made my way back up the food chain, and now I call myself a vegetarian with meat-eating tendencies. <laughs> well, I like that. Well, we'll be talking with John about this, about what paleo is, about what a great caveman diet is, a farmer diet, an industrial diet, and even why vegan or vegetarian may not be the way to go. I think this will be a fun and fascinating talk, which one... One which may have you questioning your own food choices and habits and asking, what would caveman do? So, welcome to the show, John. Are you ready to shine? I'm ready to shine, baby. Woohoo! All right. <laughs> so, all right, let's, let's dive right into this. You are known as a caveman. Why? <laughs> Well, I, I'm, I found the one profession where it was an asset to grow a lot of hair and have a beard and long hair. So uh, I, I looked apart. But, you know, the, 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 the short answer is it just sort of makes sense to look at where we come from. Mm -hmm. if, if, if we want to get, to, you know, if we want to know where we're going, it helps to know where we come from. And I had studied some evolution in college and it, I, I just found the explanatory power incredible and very satisfying and then when you start to apply it to different health problems in my own life or in other people's lives it, it was it was a really easy way to cut through the clutter but now in the beginning meaning after school you weren't a caveman you were, no you were going the other way <laughs> yeah. you know I, I i moved to new york city i was living in a tiny apartment wasn't getting much sun the typical work hard play hard lifestyle yeah. and People view it as normal to get to their first desk job, put on 30 pounds, uh, have their energy spike and crash throughout the day, yeah. um, and, and, and they view that as a normal part of getting older. Their metabolism is slowing down. And I just, I, that was not a, I was not satisfied with that answer. I was, I was a young man, I was 22 years old. Uh, so I, you know, I started poking around and my, my brother sent me an essay by a guy named Art Devaney who was one of the influential figures early on in paleo. Okay. Started yeah. reading his blog. Um, and, and the advice to look at what, what wild humans do, what humans did in the wild, just struck a chord with me because I had studied some evolution. I was like, okay, that, that's, it, it, that's a good place to start. It doesn't mean, you know, it, it, people say, well, it's idolizing life in the wild. It doesn't mean that life in the wild was perfect. It doesn't mean that 
you know, hunter gatherers were perfectly healthy or that we want to emulate every part of their existence. It, it, doesn't, mean you're saying, it, it doesn't mean you're saying ooga booga, throw it out the Skype and the cell phone. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I try to take the best of the old with the best of the new. Yeah. And, and you know what? Some Increasingly, people would probably be better if they did throw out the cell phone or at I least turn it off sometimes. The, the, I am, I'm addicted to my phone. Mm-hmm. I, like I'm coming to grips with a physical addiction my phone. Um, you you got to try my approach. So um, years ago, I was healing after my first near-death accident, and right. I had my phone with me out on the trails, and a near and dear friend called. And so I went home and canceled my service. <laughs> and and Jessica got me to have a cell phone for a while, but it just felt so wrong. I felt that need to have at least a little buffer, a little disconnect. Well, so step one is deactivating the push notifications for, for your apps. There's no reason that Facebook should be buzzing your phone in your pocket every five minutes. That's and here's what's, here's what's really insidious about it. Mm-hmm. There have been some interesting studies on how addictions form, and they've found that addictions form if there's a little bit of randomness thrown in. So like if you give the rat uh, the sugar water or the, the, the morphine, yeah. Not Ooh. just on a regular schedule, but like occasionally there's some uh, some randomness thrown in. Um, people get addicted to that pattern much more quickly. Um, the surprise, and that, the, 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 I mean, it's a chemical reaction, so the rush. Correct, correct. And so you don't get habituated to it quite as quite as fast, and, it, and it's more psychologically compelling. Like, it, it, you know, if, if, if you hear the same noises over and over, it will eventually fade to the background. Um, but, but our phones have this like regular predictable, but semi random buzzing and, uh, it's really psychologically addicting. Uh, so I've turned up, it's exciting. It's and there's a little dopamine hit when I'm on Twitter and I refresh Twitter and there's like, Oh, here's a new, you know, here's a new page of blather, um, (laughs) and, and negative news, um, and all sorts of things like that. So I, I've turned off push notifications. I had a friend who just uninstalled. He'll he'll occasionally go and check Facebook, mm-hmm. but he'll only do it through his browser. He won't use the app because the app makes it really easy. Okay. Um, and and he just found that he was he was missing moments with his children and with his wife, um, and and so he uninstalled the app. Uh, so the, those are those are some tips that I like. You know, it. I like yeah. it. So let's let's talk about um, zoo animals. Yeah, don't have cell phones. <laughs> yeah, this this is fascinating. We actually started going into this off air beforehand because it's it's so exciting. What what the light went off for you when you saw zoo animals, right? Or on yeah. Ball? So so I start my book by going on this adventure to the Cleveland Zoo. Yeah, and and they have these two incredible uh, male bachelor gorillas there named Beback and Makolo. Now, um, it, a lot of people don't realize this, but there are. There are obesity is very widespread in zoos, um, and and we don't realize this in part because it's just sort of hard to tell whether another species is overweight or not. Mm-hmm. You know, these gorillas are very large; they have a different body shape. It's hard to sort of do a spot check and see if they're obese. You're not well, turns out feeling their ribs. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So um, it turns out that the number one killer mm-hmm. of male gorillas in captivity is heart disease, just which like is us. Just just like us, just like well, just like male humans in, in civilization, mm-hmm. we have a little bit, you know, higher heart disease rates than women. Um, and occasionally, these gorillas they go into cardiac arrest and they fall over and they die. The, the equivalent of middle age for gorillas. Now, this is this is traumatic for people at zoos and and the veterinarians there. They love the animals. They care about them very much. Yeah. And. You know, it's also, they're a big draw to, to get kids and other people into the zoo, and, uh, and they're expensive. So it's, it's a really big issue. Now, the problem that zoos have is they don't, um, they, they don't have a huge budget. So they're trying to figure out, okay, well, how do, how do we get these animals to be healthy? Well, what they did was they shifted their diet um, away from what are called gorilla biscuits. And a gorilla it, biscuit, that's, that's flour, that's grain. It, 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 it's a, it was a fiber bar that there are different types of them. The ones that they were using were corn based. Uh, they experimented with a wheat based one. Yeah. Uh, and, and then they would supplement with some leafy plants and fruit. 
Um, and the gorilla, but the gorillas could eat all of like this bucket of gorilla biscuits in mm-hmm. 15, 20 minutes. And then they, they would have nothing to do all day. I mean, wild gorillas spend the vast majority of their waking hours eating. So I think when I think of a wild gorilla and I think of a wild gorilla, when I think it comes to, to tooth health, um, I think of a wild gorilla chewing all day and the salivary response. And I actually imagine, and I have, I have no knowledge of there being science about this, that may actually have to do even with the heart and with the brain of that, that masticating or that chewing response all day. Uh, I, I, would, I would not doubt it. I would not doubt it. The, um, they've definitely found that behavioral problems mm-hmm. went away uh, once they shifted to a fully plant-based diet closer to what gorillas would eat in the wild. They also eat some insects and, uh, and maybe a few other things opportunistically. But um, it's, it's a very important part of their, of their lifestyle, this feeding behavior. And they, they shifted to a, plant, a fully plant-based diet. They got rid of all the gorilla biscuits. And miracle of miracles, all these health problems started going away. Uh, their weight normalized. Makolo, I think, lost about uh, 70 pounds. Uh, VBAC lost about 35. VBAC's a bit smaller. Um, don't quote me on those exact numbers. Um, the, uh, their blood work improved. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, some problematic behaviors like hair plucking and other things improved. And, you know, on the one hand, this should seem, this probably seems sort of obvious to people. It's like, of course, while, you know, of course gorillas in captivity should, we should try to sort of mimic their lifestyle in the wild. So, but this is actually a really profound insight, right? <laughs> so, so what you're saying is we it might, are gorillas. It might be relevant to other primates <laughs> like us. So I, the reason why I started, I, I don't use the word paleo in the entire chapter talking about the gorillas. Because yeah. it's not about the paleolithic. It's just about the evolutionary biology of western lowland gorillas and what's appropriate for them. Um, and what's appropriate for them is going to be different than what's appropriate for a lion or a wolf or a snake or other or a human. Um, but when you start with humans, everybody has preconceived ideas and ideologies and religions, and 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 it can be hard to have an honest discussion, including myself. I bring stuff to the table. I have baggage. Um, and w- but very few people have opinions about Western lowland gorillas. So. So if you start there, it's like starting in neutral territory, and it allows you to actually make some progress in how to think about how to prevent uh, a lot of these chronic health conditions. So if we if we go then from from the gorillas, which are a caged animal, and and I look around us, driving our our, our steel cages around with us, and and living in our steel cages and working in our steel cages. Sometimes there's cement too. <laughs> the, 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 certainly, we could have some cement, as do the gorillas on their floors. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, it's 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 amazing, um, and and there have actually been some great books uh, over the his. Um, there's one called Ishmael mm-hmm. that sort of got into some of these themes. Oh yes, with the gorilla. Uh, yeah, with the gorilla. So that's that's a classic, Daniel Quinn. So let's let's extrapolate forward. So you take this and you start thinking about probably yourself and about us, and then I think one of the first things that you you looked into from there maybe is um, infant de- development. Or what babies were eating? Yeah, well, you know, um, there there are lots of ways to understand how to be healthy. And when I look at, when you look at, say, uh, you can learn a lot from human breast milk and and infants. One is that uh, fat is not evil, right? A a high percentage of, of calories in breast milk is fat, including saturated fats. And so, um, Sometimes when, when the media is telling us that uh, fat is evil or conventional wisdom, you can step back a little bit and say, well, hold on a sec. Like, it's not bad for you in infancy. Um, and, you know, a, a second thing that you can learn is we have tried to re-engineer uh, infant formula or engineer it yeah. for over a century, and it has been an unmitigated disaster. Um, there have there's been instance after instance where we think we know everything mm-hmm. and we don't you know at first they thought it was just okay let's get carbs protein and fat and then okay well we need essential amino we need to make sure we have all the essential amino acids and the micronutrients um, and then they're like oh the microbiome 
there's all the, the you know there are all these things in human breast milk that aren't even intended for the baby per se, but to feed beneficial bacteria in the baby's gut. Um, so I think that's a biggie because yeah, as I'm going down this road and and we talked off air about how I had uh, my wife and I were sick from mold toxicity in our previous home right. uh, before coming here and. Um, the biggest way that you can boost your immune system is a well-populated gut. Right. Well, you know, the people don't think of the gut as part of our immune system, but, but when you really think about it, the gut and the skin are our two largest sources of contact with the outside world. Makes sense. And, and as such, uh, you know, microorganisms coat the inside of our gut, they coat the outside of our skin, and they are literally the first line of defense. They are the first thing that comes in contact with any foreign object or, or life form. And, and so, of course, having a healthy, in retrospect, of course, having a healthy microbiome is an important part of immune rec- regulation. Um, so, you know, it, it, it really is gratifying, I have to say, after, after for me, at least five years, and for many other people in the Weston Price Foundation and things like that who have been talking about gut health for a long time, it's very gratifying that conventional science is coming around to the importance of gut health. I, you know, I've seen all these articles come out like every, every other day, it seems like, uh, tying gut health to mood um, and uh, all sorts of disparate autoimmune conditions. Yeah, and brain um, health. Brain, health, and is brain a, health is a biggie. Oh, it's enormous. It's enormous. It's enormous. So, um, you know, we have, we have this, uh, shoot, what's the name of the big nerve? Um, I'm forgetting the name of the big nerve that goes from the gut uh, up to the brain. But, you know, they're sure all... the vagal nerve or... I don't think so. Vagus? Vagus? No, there's a vagal nerve, but I don't think that's... Sorry, I'm not going to get it either. Well, it's not my sweet spot. So, <laughs> um, but it's... it's it's really incredible. So, what 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 are the go-to sort of fermented foods in your in your diet in your uh, life? You know, it's it's ebbed and flowed. So so it is anything from um, we were doing uh, kombucha for a while. Uh, we've actually stopped doing that once we started getting moldy. That probably wasn't the way to go. So we had kombucha. We had kefir, and these are all things. I say we've made myself. I put that in quotes. Jessica is the is the one who who does these things. We were even uh, selling them at farmers market. So kombucha, kefir, kimchi, um, uh, cultured um, sprouted nut butters for a while. Um, obviously your sauerkraut. Yeah. Say that yeah, again. I love, I love a good a, a red cabbage sauerkraut is my favorite. I love Ooh, it. That's great. And then for myself, I'd throw in some, maybe some, some garlic and some hot peppers in there, um, make them really fun, but uh, couldn't agree more. Maybe some beets even. I, um, I, I highly recommend, I don't, I don't know if any of your listeners have read Michael Pollan's Cooked. It was Michael Pollan's most recent book, and he's sort of the uh, food journalist, author of Omnivore's Dilemma. and Independence. Yes, yes. The, the fourth part of his book, Cooked, is on fermentation. And, it, and, and that part is worth the price of the book alone. It is phenomenal. It's absolutely phenomenal on, on the interaction between microorganisms and human health. It's, it's, a, it's really wonderful. This, this is going to maybe gross people out a little bit. But when, see, when you start going down this caveman road, uh, as, as you've gone down, it starts getting a little, it's a slippery slope, and it gets kind of weird. So I get out, uh, I'm running, particularly when I was running in Hawaii, and you'd find food on the ground, you know, fruits everywhere. And we all think we want to eat the perfect fruit. But I don't think caveman only ate the one perfect fruit. He or she ate what was available. And that fruit might have been a little bit fermented. And that may have actually been good for us in small amounts. In large amounts, you're drunk. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, I I mean, we've certainly swung to an overly hygienic extreme Mm -hmm. where even people are concerned about rolling around in the dirt and and things like that and you know kids kids getting dirty on the playground and that's silly um and you know the funny thing about you know about these issues you say this may gross people out you know that's our disgust reflex and disgust as you read in my book i i spent a couple chapters where disgust 
plays a very large role. Disgust is a very important emotion and sort of regu- behavior uh, regulation mechanism in how, primarily in how we interact with microorganisms. The, the, uh, when, when somebody's disgust is sort of, you can think of it as a quote, intuitive microbiology. It mm-hmm. keeps us away from things that could potentially infect us. Absolutely. The problem is, is that, you know, when you're young, culture matters too. And when you're young, it sort of sets your disgust reflex. Like if, if you eat kimchi when you're young, it tastes good to you when you're older. But like if you try it when you're older, it might not taste as good. Uh, another one, one of my favorites, absolute favorites, um, is uh, natto. Uh, right. And, and that would be very high for people on the disgust factor. Correct. And, and, and I have two jars of natto sitting in my fridge that a friend made for me herself. Mm-hmm. And I have not been able to <laughs> stomach to it, but I have to do it. But, you know, so our, so disgust is really important. And when you think about the behavioral response when somebody's disgusted, what do they do? They usually gag, mm-hmm. open their mouth and gag, um, sometimes move away from something. And that's the appropriate be- behavioral response to something that might infect you. You know, get it out of your mouth Good point. and move away from it. Um, the, the problem is, is that we have become so, uh, our disgust reflex, like our immune, it's part of our immune system. Mm-hmm. It's become so out of whack. It's become hypersensitive such that the slightest little, you know, things can, can gross us out which isn't actually healthy for us. What's really fun is when you start going down this rabbit hole, we were, we were introduced by a, a, a dear friend on Hawaii to a lot of different fermented foods. Yeah. And he had these foods that were, well, they were funky. And, and they were alive and they were pasty and they were weird. And it almost looked like the old John Cusack movie was at uh, uh, Better Off Dead where something s- slime mold is crawling across the counter. Um, but we started to develop a different nose for these things where you could tell um, what was funky good (laughs) and what is funky bad so that we weren't scared off. And what ended up happening is the funky good stuff we were more attracted to and we wanted to put it in our gut until we'd get to a certain level. And then the gut would say, I have enough of that. Can we please not have any more of that for a while? But you really... And I think a lot of that came from, and, and I want to jump right back into this. Let's, let's get into what, what the paleo diet is here. A lot of that came from getting some of the foods out of our system that we're so addicted to. I call them rocket fuel, that they completely short-circuited our yeah. entire palate, our entire uh, mental discussion of what's food and what's not. And, and microbiome, if, if you just have a diet of, you know, cheap, cheap carbohydrate grains and refined sugar, it, it feeds a certain type of bacteria. That oh, candida out. and stuff, and you were yeah. going, woohoo! And right, so you, right. you just look at it, and, and because when we feed, um, like feeding a cultured nut butter, when you start to feed it, it starts frothing, and it, 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 it kind of bubbles up. And I imagine when you show yourself a carbohydrate, uh, all of a sudden, something in your stomach and your gut is frothing up, coming to life. And so when you feel this, this shaky, craving, desire, I need to have not just my coffee, but I need my coffee with its, its, its sugar in it, with its this in it. It's not you that's talking to you. It's what's going on. It, it's those, those little wee beasties in you that are having a party. And they're going to give you either a party response or bang you upside the head, depending on whether you feed them or starve them. That's right. I like that little wee beasties. <laughs> I like that. They're in control. <laughs> They're in control. They're in control. They're in control. So uh, paleo diet. Yeah. So so jumping forward then, what are let uh, people ta- people have heard the word paleo. They've heard caveman. And right. uh, Jessica and I were actually discussing this earlier today on a hike, and we were saying that it'd be it'd be almost better if there was a different word than paleo because. Paleo encompasses it, but but it kind of scares people because who wants to be a caveman today? Yeah, not everybody wants to identify with it, and that's fine. That's fine. And the other thing I don't like about the word is that it literally means old. You know, so it's very right. It, it's it's very backward looking. Um, and I also want to move forward and you know 
just because something's new doesn't mean it's bad. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, but, but it is what it is. Um, you know, one, one of the misconceptions of, of paleo, and, and, and some, of the, some of the people within paleo are probably responsible, but also some people outside of it, is, you know, hunter-gatherer diets were quite diverse. We were opportunistic omnivores. Mm -hmm. We ate a lot of things that were available in the environment. And in fact, if, you know, if you look at a lot of hunter-gatherer diets, they're more broad. They're eating a wider variety of plant and animal species than most people do today. But if I stop you there and we went back in time, at least the common conception is, yeah, that's great, John, hunter-gatherers, but didn't hunter-gatherers like die really, really young? Right, right. Well, so first of all, they, they didn't die as young as most people think. Mm -hmm. um, and the second thing is, some of that was a, a decent proportion of that was infant mortality. And so now that doesn't kill people nearly as much anymore. So if we, took, um, if we filtered out the numbers of took infant mortality out of there, there were still elders. There were people in their 60s, their elders. 70s, their 80s. The, there, there, are two, there are two big mortality spikes. Mm -hmm. One is infancy, and then one is around sort of age five and six. And if you make it past those two mortality spikes, then you have a pretty good chance of living into your sort of 50s, 60s. So, so when we think of, um, it, you know, and, and each species has sort of a natural lifespan. You know, when you think about elephants or mice, each species has evolved a lifespan. Yes. That, um, and and the, the natural human lifespan seems to be many people having fairly robust health into their 60s. Um, and, and so that evolved it looks like that evolved at the end of the paleo, by the end of the Paleolithic, there were regularly people sort of living into their 60s, maybe even their 70s. Beautiful. I'm noticing uh, a bit of feedback on your end. Okay. Is there a way to turn down my volume just a little bit? Yep. I'm going to note Is that. that any better? Is that Testing. any better? One, two, three. That's better. Yes. Okay, good. So they were actually living longer and it, I, I know in the book you talk about uh, visiting uh, Dr. Lieberman's lab in Harvard, and yeah. he puts this skull in your hands. It's 80,000 years old. I, I, I was so nervous that I was going to drop it. I'm thankfully holding it over a little table. But, <laughs> so they, Harvard has this amazing fossil archive, mm -hmm. and it, some of, you know, many of their fossils are on display for the public, but they have a private one with certain scientific artifacts that are still being studied are just very rare. And so I was fortunate enough to, to get to go behind the scenes with, with Dr. Lieberman, who's known, as you know, uh, for doing a lot of these barefoot running studies and research. Yeah, he's one um, of the leaders. Dr. Lieberman and Dr. Bramble are two of the leaders yeah. in looking at evolutionary biology. And I, I can't say enough good things about Dan Lieberman. Mm -hmm. He is an amazing scientist. He he criticized, when we would have conversations about topics of the book, he would criticize me on so much, and it was so helpful to have him push me away from being overly ideological in certain areas. Yeah. Um, it, he, he's, he's a phenomenal scientist. So, um, the, and, and he has a really fun treadmill. <laughs> he does. He does. So, um, so I got to hold uh, this skull. Um, it, it's named School 5, S-K-H-U-L, then the number 5, based on the cave that it was found in uh, modern-day Israel. Um, and it's this amazingly robust, healthy hunter-gatherer that was about 5 foot 10, yeah. uh, thick bone structure. Um, and what was amazing about the skull was just a beautiful set of teeth without cavities, and they, all, all the teeth came in straight. Um, including wisdom teeth. Without there was reason. one tooth that that he had lost to an abscess. So, but you know, life wasn't perfect. We don't want to idolize it, but it's really incredible to think that, you know, long, long, tens of thousands of years before dentists, this guy had a perfectly straight, beautiful set of teeth. Um, and part of it was, like you talked about earlier, mastication, uh, chewing. This this guy was eating tougher foods. He was using his jaw, and uh, bone structure and bone density responds to use use particularly during youth. Um, and and so the guy had a jaw that was large enough to fit all his teeth. Um, 
Then we go, and he shows me some of these early farmers. Oh, no. These guys looked, and gals looked miserable. So, we, you know, he hands me some of their skulls. Um, the skulls are smaller. Uh, they chunk a little bit. The teeth were just riddled with cavities. Um, and it, actually, that's, that's sort of the quickest way that an anthropolo- a paleoanthropologist, at a glance, if they have to say, is this pre-agriculture or post-agriculture, they look at the, at the dental cavity. Um, and if there are a bunch of caries, if there are a bunch of cavities, then they're like, okay, well, this was, this was an early farmer. Um, higher, higher carbohydrate intake. But then it was also, they were, you know, there were tiny bits of stone that got ground up um, in, in their food and that would wear away at the teeth. Um, and then they were probably vitamin D deficient. Too. So in terms of bone structure and some other things. Uh, it's, it's fascinating because teeth are something that I've been neurotic almost my entire life of trying to take care of my teeth as good as I can. And um, until the last couple years, teeth would fracture on me left and right. I'd have cavity after cavity after cavity. And I that none of that stopped. And, and, and I think, I hope, I believe, <laughs> we've got it under control, particularly doing bone broth and stuff now. Uh, But it didn't really stop until I got the sugar out of my diet, not because the sugar was in my mouth as much as the yep, da 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 da, up, down, up, down, up, down swings of blood sugar and the buffering and pulling calcium out of the bones and out of the teeth to buffer my blood sugar levels. Yep. Yep. I have no idea. Well, and, and, and dental health and skeletal health do often go hand in hand. Um, you know, and you, you've had a journey with your vegetarianism and veganism and, you know, unfortunately bone fractures are one of these things that, that crops up in the literature as, as, as some, you know, some people struggle with. Um, and, uh, you know, if they actually, one of the theories for why lighter skin evolved Mm -hmm. in people as they moved away from the equator was that, if, if women didn't get enough vitamin D, uh, then their bone structure would become brittle and wouldn't grow large enough, and they might be more likely to die in childbirth because of bone fractures. Um, Fascinating. There, there's some competing hypotheses there, but um, that would, you know, something like that, when you have a direct impact on reproduction, um, you can have evolution and adaptation happen very quickly, very quickly. So... so Jumping forward, we go from um, caveman, uh, or what we ate before the agricultural revolution. We get to the agricultural revolution. Um, I grew up in a good Jewish household. Um, I've been uh, exposed to eating kosher. You, you still can't get me to eat a pig. And, <laughs> um, and, and you know, there are blessings of washing your hands before the meal, and or specifically washing your hands before you eat bread and yeah. and so we got to this section of the book about the torah and moses and eating kosher and i'm like i'm like all over this going this explains it <laughs> that it was my favorite chapter in the book it was my favorite chapter to research and it was yeah. my favorite chapter to write um it, for for the listeners it's called moses the microbiologist um and awesome it it i i <sighs> Infectious disease was the greatest health risk in the agricultural age. Mm-hmm. So, so we domesticate plants and animals, we become farmers, we form cities. Um, and even though our diet had deteriorated, it was really disease that was the number one killer. And things like typhoid and malaria and dysentery and smallpox and, you know, all these nasty things. And, uh, you know, the, the thing about germs is that they're usually invisible um, and they can spread via so many different vectors. Yeah. So it's hard to understand. It's just, it's just scientifically difficult to understand. The germ theory of disease was not understood and formalized until the very end of the 19th century. This is a very recent uh, discovery. Um, and, and so back then, all people see is that there are a heck of a lot of people who just keep on getting sick and falling over and dying. And so, of course, people attribute, you know, something, these, these invisible effects to the gods or God. Um, and, and so the chapter, as you know, is really about how... The how, wrath of God. 
the, the wrath of God. The, these people are these people are sinners. They're being punished by God for doing something wrong, um, and and that helps to explain the emergence of certain religious cultures that place an enormous emphasis on purity and hygiene. Um, I and, think and that word that word is so important because when we were talking about the wrath of God against people who are quote unclean <laughs> correct and 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 as 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 i'm sure you know since you're jewish this this notion of unclean uncleanliness and sin were were pretty much one in the same mm -hmm. early on and these days they've sort of drifted apart a little bit and and taken on a more abstract thing but but back then it, it literally was like a, a a physical condition that when you were unclean, you had to go through a set of rituals before you could be con considered clean again. Um, hand washing, bathing, uh, food inspection rules. You know, everybody gets so uh, focused on pork and shellfish. When you look, really look at kashrut as a whole, mm -hmm. um, pork and shellfish are part of it, but it's not like those are the first two things mentioned or, you know, they're singled out as, as being important or particularly important. You know, not touching corpses, not eating any animal that died of its own accord, uh, staying away from blood, staying away from vermin and insects and things like that. Those, <laughs> those are really common, what we would consider today very, like, common sense uh, things to do with your food supply. So I like it. In the book, you go through and you, and you say, you know, Deuteronomy section here or this section there, and you show where we may look at a line in, in the Bible or in the Torah, and, and uh, on face value, we don't realize that what this is really is a hygiene manual. <laughs> it's a hygiene manual, and, and it's, not, it's not a perfect one, but it's yeah. a darn good one for, for the time. And, and it, you know, it, it can help us... Um, even traditional, even things like traditional sexual codes, uh, which, you know, today there are large culture wars raging, raging around it, but, you know, traditional sexual codes, um, lifelong monogamy in particular, is an effective way to avoid STDs. When you didn't and, have antibiotics, yeah. Yeah, and you didn't have antibiotics, you didn't have condoms, and guess what? Women bear most of the co more of the cost of STDs than men do because they're more likely to go infertile mm -hmm. um, and, and that has a much greater impact on a woman standing in society uh, you know than, than the equivalent for men um, and you know so so in that context if a, if a woman either made one wrong decision or if she got raped um, and it wasn't her decision you know these these were these were very important moments because if she contracted something incurable, she could end up infertile for the rest of her life. Um, and that was not a, that was not a, back then, that was not a good thing to be. Um, so, you know, today, now that we understand hygiene, now that we have antibiotics, now that, um, now that we have, you know, condoms and things like that, um, we, I think we've sort of forgotten how devastating it could be um, in some ways, uh, to, to contract some of these things. In parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, there, there are areas where, you know, upwards of 15% of women who are still of childbearing age are infertile uh, because, because of some incurable STD. So it's, it's, it's really serious. So let's, let's move forward from that. Let's go back to um, diet. And uh, I want to look at one particular thing that um, this is something that that has been I don't know if bugaboo or reverse bugaboo is something that I've intuitively known for a year and I've really grabbed onto now but but I've intuitively got and it's so against the mainstream which is fat as good <laughs> right because oh. I love fat and 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 I flip the 80 20 10, or, or what is it, the, the 80, 20, 80, 10, 10, whatever it is, I flip that yeah. diet on its head. It, it's unfortunate that the word fat is the same word to describe the, the, the nutrient, mm -hmm. the macronutrient, as it is to describe the condition of being overweight. Because, uh, you know, people think fat, well, I don't want to be fat, shouldn't eat fat. I, I, I really think a large part of it is simply due to that. Um, fat is, uh, you know, it's just been demonized for so long. 
um, and, and to have a more balanced relationship with it. It's, it's a more even source of energy, you know, w- when you become a fat burner. Um, uh, you know, and, and we have, you know, so many people say, oh, I want to be energetic. Um, or I, I want to have more energy. And, and, and so they turn to these high-carb energy drinks, or they turn to caffeine or things like that. What I call well, rocket fuel. Rocket fuel. They turn to rocket fuel. But it, it's, not, it's not that we lack energy. You know, we all have enough fat deposits on our body to go run multiple marathons. I mean, it, we have incredible energy stores in our body. Mm-hmm. It's that our, we want to feel energetic. Not that we don't have energy, that we want to feel energetic and yeah, have a- immediate access to it immediate access to it and uh and if you want to get off that roller coaster if you want to get off the rocket um becoming more fat adapted and having more fat in your diet uh is is a great way to get that more sort of e- even even energy yeah and for myself so. i know because i had uh, i struggled with uh, hypoglycemia uh, basically a pre-diabetic condition till about mm, somewhere around three, four years ago. And it was a giant roller coaster ride for me. And um, it was an emotional roller coaster ride, something that could have been devastated to our marriage even, because when when uh, my blood sugar levels would crash, my eyeballs would bounce into each other. <laughs> and, and, and I could not think, and I would shake, and I would be upset. When I went even higher on fat content and pulled out, I went for first a year without carbs and made a big difference. And then I discovered that there was a pineapple field near my house, an abandoned pineapple field. (laughs) Ha ha. And I completely reverted back within a couple months. And then I went about two years carb free. This sounds radical. Um, But since that time, the engine that I have I can skip meals, I can miss meals, I can go for a 100 mile bike ride, I can do intermittent fasting, and it is steady as she goes, or if I'm really waning, I wane. I don't crash. I go a little bit quieter, a little bit quieter, because I don't have the fuel in me. I love that. It, um, it's, it's exactly right. And a, I think a good measure of whether you're healthy or not is whether you can skip a meal and still be a well-functioning human being, right? If, if, if you skip a meal and your whole world collapses around you, you're not a very robust organism. But right? we've been taught, we've been taught, though, that if you don't get three squares a day, so that your book is breaking down a lot of taboos here, because we've been yeah. taught if you don't get three square meals a day, a is it, it isn't healthy. It's 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 not good on the system. It's undue stress on the system, and you're gonna get fat because you're gonna go into starvation mode immediately. It, you know, I, again, this is where I look to the animal kingdom, mm-hmm. and and I had already talked about eating frequency with gorillas. They're adapted to eating consistently all day because that's that's how they evolved. Um, and, and there's this amazing study of gorillas in the, to- or of lions in the Topeka Zoo, and they, they were feeding them very regularly once yep. a day, and they shifted them to a gorge and fast feeding model like wild lions, and only feeding them every few days. And miracle of miracles, some of these health problems went away. So th- and, and I, like, I like thinking about that because we, we have cats in our house. My, my wife is a, 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 a kitty cat fanatic as many people are I, I love my cats dearly too and and I think about them who are not quite as healthy as they could be and we feed them very regularly and we feed them exactly when they want to be fed but I but I think about them out in nature they got food when they got food and they didn't when they did right <laughs> they're, they're predators they're predators and and predators do tend to have that more uh, variable eating pattern um, and, and, and so it's, it's a very, it can be very counterintuitive to think about the importance of uh, one variability mm-hmm. in, in how we eat and eating frequency, and two, the benefit of nothing sometimes. So why are you know? these important? Well, <clears throat> if, 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 we've, if we've evolved under conditions of variability, mm-hmm. um, we probably thrive when we get some of that variation. So if you think about only running on a treadmill and all you ever do experience is perfect conditions on a treadmill, flat, air-conditioned, 
First you go out on with the lack of diversity. I've got an overuse injury right there because it's a it's it's right. too perfect. It's that's right. Too pure. That's right. And and so the body is able to adapt and become more robust um, and, and and not get broken down in one area uh, when you get those diverse inputs. When you get uh, rough surfaces, soft surfaces, uphill, downhill. Uh, dry, wet, all those different things are that variability is good for us. Um, just, just like people get it when it, when you talk about seasonal eating. Okay, maybe our diet should change a little bit over the seasons or things like that. Very variation can be healthy. Um, you know, the 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 second thing, uh, the benefit of nothing. Um, yeah, you know, there are there are just all sorts of processes that take place in the body. Um, when we aren't eating, and those are beneficial too, and and they need time to operate, um, you know. So so different methods of of uh, basically cleaning out cells. Uh, the cells will recycle uh, different damaged proteins or da- damaged organelles, damaged mitochondria uh, when when protein um, or other nutrients are scarce. And, and that actually has a beneficial effect. Uh, DNA repair mechanisms get triggered too, uh, autophagy. Um, a lot of people have written about it. So, so you know, nothing isn't nothing. It's, it's still something. Um, and, and it's important to integrate. You know, just like quiet is important. I love You know, that. sometimes, right? Quiet needs to be a part of your day or your week. Um, I'm have spent the last 10 years in New York City and there's very little quiet and it's driving me crazy and I need some quiet I need some nothing um, and and in a similar way we need we need some hunger sometimes we need some fasting uh, I think when you get off of that grain or sugar based diet there there are times like I I fasted last night and and my wife said well it's just because you read John's book I'm like no I wasn't hungry since about midday, and my body said it's time to take a break. <laughs> yeah, and 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 but here here's the thing is that the first time someone fasts, sometimes they're just a lot of people are just addicted to sugar, so it may seem hard. But 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 if there are persistent hunger pangs, and I mean something more than like half an hour, or forty minutes, which is sort of oh, I'm supposed to be eating right now, and I'm really hungry. Um, Somebody might have a micronutrient deficiency because what part of the you know the body's uh, methods of telling you how much to eat and satiation uh, is geared around micronutrients and getting enough of them. So if people do have persistent hunger when trying to fast, you may want to try to address the micronutrients. That makes sense. So let's let's look at at uh, paleo as a whole. We're looking at getting out grains and I'm assuming yep. it's getting out all grains it's it's looking at a, a higher fat diet with some saturated fat some cholesterol actually in there it's getting away from processed food but by that we mean industrial foods um, and it may mean uh, listening to what our body wants maybe on top of that if I was to add one would it be well I guess I guess we'll go into that next but I want to talk about organic as well, but can you address a few of these things? I gave you a yeah. lot at once. Yeah, so I, I mean, what, what everybody sort of agrees on is removing industrial processed foods from your diet. If, you have, if, if your diet is an industrial diet, you're, you're not going to end up in a good spot. And industrial um, means? Industrial means uh, the foods that entered the human diet over the last 200 years since the Industrial Revolution. It's the refined sugar, the distilled alcohol, the refined grains. You know the the frozen pizzas and the you know and the marmalade and all you know all sorts of things like that. Um, marmalade. Whoever whoever says marmalade when they're listening. <laughs> but I'm thinking like 19th century and things like that. You know the white flour. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and nobody's adapted to that. We've only been eating those foods for you know three, four, five generations. Um, and 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 so nobody's adapted to that. The next step is to say, okay, well, we spent, you know, maybe five to 10,000 years eating agricultural foods, so grains and legumes and dairy. Um, and and so that paleo says take those out. So people people have their own little flavors of things. 
uh, where they may flex a little bit more on on, on different agricultural foods. Um, and, and then saying, okay, paleolithic, uh, meat, fish, vegetables, roots and tubers, fruit, nuts, seeds, eggs, honey, um, you know, eating nose to tail, eating animals that themselves ate their natural diet. To stop your fermentation. Nose, nose to tail is one I don't think many people are familiar with, which is you go to Costco these days and, and you get your, your slab of fish. Um, but I think you're completely missing out. Uh, Asian diet may understand this better, better than the Western diet is there's a lot more to a fish. There's a lot more to a cow. I mean, a Jewish background, uh, my, my grandmother's chopped liver was, chopped was liver. absolutely oh. amazing. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> so we're looking yeah. at I, it, and, and I've had like even chicken feet, and I think I've even had beak of all things. I mean, these are all, when you're talking tip to tail, you're talking eat the whole animal. Well, each part has different nutrients in it, and, and, and that's the beauty of it. So. Uh, when you're talking about chicken feet, those are great for making bone broth because chicken feet have lots of collagen in it, and you get the collagen out of it. Um, oh, when, we've been, we've been an, an addict. Jesse would be uh, would want me to say uh, your new company, hopefully, or, or one of the companies you're working with, maybe Thrive. Is uh, we, we got these collagen supplements because uh, she intuitively got it, and and when her family served us a month or so ago, this uh, like beef tendons or something and i'm going why is my body wanting this <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah the, the body's smart uh, asian cultures have a lot of great traditions around food and, and different parts of the animal and you know there, there's an old uh, i think it's a chinese saying what you know eat what ails you and so if uh you know if you're if you're having issues with heart or liver or bones or something like that the idea is eat eat that in another animal and if you have a micronutrient deficiency in that part well that part from another animal is likely to contain it um i love that so, i never thought of, i say i love that realizing i come from a vegetarian or vegan background so i'm still like the poor animals and i, I do mean that and and the food yeah. chain and the earth but on the other hand it ain't working for me that's right and 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 like you we need you here with us right you've you've <laughs> undergone some more ordeals than than most people have to we need we need you with us doing this and doing what you're doing and that means you as a human being have to be strong mm -hmm. um and so <laughs> you, you know <laughs> for so my some, wife and for the kids that we want to have <laughs> yeah, right like we're, we're not talking about you know you know optimal versus slightly suboptimal like you know, you, you've you, you've been on the edge sometimes, and uh, so so um, you know we. Here, here's the other thing, though, is that um, a, a lot of vegetarians basically boy, it's basically a boycott on meat, saying we're not going to eat meat. Um, the problem is, is that if if you have, say that there's a million dollars that people are no longer spending on meat. Yeah. The, the big guys, the, the, the Cargills and the Tysons and, and, and those folks, they don't, they don't even notice, you know, that the million dollars is gone or whatever amount, you know, okay, so they take a 2% knock to their, you know, to their bottom line. Well, they just turn around, they sell, uh, you know, industrially grown soybeans and Boca burgers right back to folks. But that which same million dollars. Do, which is what I used to be a processed food vegan and i didn't even get that concept that there's something wrong with living on veggie burgers or chicken patties <laughs> yeah yeah well you know it, but i but i will say the plant-based side of things has i've been influenced by that now both in terms of sort of the ethical arguments and i've integrated a lot more plants into my diet so mm -hmm. we're, we're learning both ways here um and I'm still a green machine. I, I, I eat so many greens, but what I'm learning is now I'm cooking a bunch of my greens, too. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and yeah, cooking is, is – I eat, I eat some things raw, I eat some things cooked. Mm -hmm. I, I do a bit of both. Um, you know, but, but you take that million dollars and you start buying products from farmers and uh, who are doing things right, who are treating their animals ethically, that are doing permaculture farming, that – uh, are experimenting with different types of composting or alternative fertilizer use or things like that. That makes a big difference 
to them. It, it, it's the difference between them going out of business and them staying in business. Yeah. Um, and, and they're the innovators. They're the innovators on the front line that say, how, how are we going to, how are we going to start up, literally start up an alternative food system? Um, so, you know, Which when, is why, when you like the farmers about, markets are so, so important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, incredibly important. So there, there's an asymmetry in the market where it, um, you can do more good. Like you, you, the, the, your your one dollar has an Im, better impact in buying from someone who's doing it right mm -hmm. than withholding from a big established player who's doing it wrong. In in many cases, in many cases. So, um, you know, and, and 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 that's part of the reason why I've been helping some of these some of these different startups um, that that I have been. Um, you know, I'm, I'm also trying to make a living here too, but, uh, fair enough. And yeah, this, right? one, this one thrive that we went, we went crazy on recently because, uh, they, they had, you know, they had the, the collagen, they had the other supplements for us. Um, and, and we were getting it at a, a discount. We couldn't even, I'm sounding like a commercial that, that was <laughs> even, even better than Amazon <laughs> and, and right. we're Amazon prime members. Right. Um, so we're like, wow. And, but it was, and Jessica's like, well, we're buying this all in bulk. And did you see this giant box? But it's okay. If I can't eat all of the animal, if I can't go hunt it and, and kill it myself. And we had a whole discussion about that on our hike this morning about could we actually kill the animals? Because you talk about in the book um, about wanting to have that relationship with your food. But if I can't, at least if I can get the collagen. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, perfect shouldn't be the enemy of the good. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and that's a hell of a lot, hell of a lot better than, than not getting it at all. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Th Thrive's been great. I mean, their, their goal for, for the listeners that they're sort of like Costco meets Whole Foods online. Um, and the idea is, you know, you could, this is, they sell the foods, um, and the household products to fill up your pantry. Mm -hmm. And then you should get your fresh food from your local farmer's market or your local grocery or something like that. Um, and it's a $60 annual membership and then you get 25 to 50% off what amounts to the non-perishable catalog at Whole Foods. Which is, is exactly where Jessica went crazy with this thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but the good thing is, you know, a lot of, since, since a lot of it is non-perishable, you know, you can, you oh, oh, crazy is a good thing. Like ghee, um, oh, yeah. it, it, we got lots of ghee, and that is just fantastic. It's so nutrient rich. It's it's a yep. it's a different kind of butter. Um, and, and we got oh, go ahead. Clarified butter. Yes, clarified butter. Um, something coming from a, an Ayurvedic tradition, an Indian tradition, um, and and really good healthy stuff. And when you try this stuff. I think the body responds. It it starts it starts to wake back up when you get the grains down. Um, it starts to to come back to life. And and I don't want to shift gears because we only got a, a little time left. Yep. Um, since uh, right now I'm I'm living with my wife's family and a a beautiful Chinese family, and um, they have a lot of white rice. And um, what I've heard as an argument is that certain cultures adapted to eat a high starch or a high grain diet, and in this case, Chinese culture, Japanese culture having um, a high rice diet. Uh, what would you say to that? You know, I, I would not be surprised at all if, if, we, if there turned out to be genetic findings supporting that, that, mm -hmm. that there's been local adaptation to a staple, staple crop. Um, the, we've certainly seen more copies of the amylase gene um, in, in humans after agriculture, which helps break down carbohydrate in your mouth. Um, there, there is, in, in, in some uh, types of rice, uh, there can be arsenic levels that can get a little bit high. Well, I've heard and, that now with, the, with the, the patties, with the fields having used, I don't know if it's fertilizer or probably not the fertilizer itself, but this is a big problem. Yeah, and, 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 I, and I actually think there's naturally occurring arsenic. It, like, it's not just a, an issue of pollution, mm -hmm. that there may be some nat naturally occurring arsenic that, that gets, you know, sucked up in, into the rice. And I wouldn't be surprised if local populations have, <clears throat> have some adaptation there, you know, versus others. Um, it, it, we don't know yet. We don't, we don't really know yet. And, and so... You know, my my general approach in my book was to say, 
if you have very old culinary traditions that are an important part of your life and your culture and your family and your community, then do them. Then do them, right? Like, it's a part... Sense. I'll go for the chopped liver. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and food is so much more than, you know, food connects people, it's how we bond, it's how we come together, and... It, you know, if you feel good and you feel healthy and you enjoy it, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to excommunicate people, um, you know, from my from my dietary ideology. I if, like that because an, an important point that you make in the book is liberating for people because a lot of people are going to read Paleo Manifesto and they're going to go clean out their, their cabinets and right. they're going to completely change everything, which when you do that, because I have in the past, do realize that you're in for one heck of a two by four over the over the head when you completely clear out your cabinets, you have no idea what to replace it with. But but with that said, is you go beyond the dogma, which is if you go to a friend's house and they go, here's a pizza, John, and I don't know if anybody would even do that to you anymore. <laughs> but if they no, people do everything. To me. If they, they love you to something do it to special, me. you eat it. Yeah. If, if I, I mean, I know my boundaries. I, if something is, it's sort of like with alcohol, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you start to develop, if you drink, you start to develop a sense of, okay, if I have three drinks, I'm going to feel it tomorrow. But if I have one, I won't. Yeah. Um, and it ha you start to develop that with different foods as well. And so, you know, if, if people have a severe gluten allergy, like they should draw a strict line, even if they're offered something, because if they're going to be on the toilet for the next three days, you know, cramped over in pain, they shouldn't need it. For me, I know what my limits are. And if I'm a guest at someone's home and they go through the effort to make me something, I'm going to eat it. If, if I'm traveling somewhere unique, I'm going to try the local cuisine and I'm not going to stress about calories, whether there's trace gluten in it or something like that, because I know that I can have a little bit of that and my world doesn't come crashing down. Um, and that, you know, you gotta live, right? You gotta shine. Um, and I part agree of completely. And, and when I've traveled for book tours and stuff and I was trying to do full vegan, like I'm, you know, I'm being put up in this beautiful island, uh, I never pronounce it right, uh, Boracay, uh, in the Philippines and I'm there on like a little vacation break in between giving talks and I can't find anything that I would eat um, I was in tears and and I've learned since then you just you have to let go and that actually that's an honoring of yourself by allowing yourself to eat whatever you need to eat that's much more important temporarily than yeah. what you did or did not put in and and I think I, you're exactly right and I and I think we underestimate the impact of human bonds and human relationships in our overall physical health and well-being. I, I mean, it to be a guest somewhere. I mean, that that is the oldest and you know way of bonding with a stranger is to say, here, let me give you food, um, and and to to spurn that is uh, I got to believe there's a negative effect on the body, <laughs> just, you know, just from not not forming that that bond and that relationship. So well, I, I've learned that helping uh, allowing others to help you is actually helping them yeah it it, it um th there can be small things in your in your daily life that might not take a lot of effort for you but they make someone else feel very good and that that helps both people right it it, it it's a win on on both sides of the ledger so let's jump in with a, a few quick wrap-up questions here. Yep. Uh, Jessica always wants me to ask um, about kids or about infants. And so what advice would you give for uh, parents or newborn parents, um, dietary things when it comes to their kids? Well, I, I, should, I should say here, I don't have any kids. Um, so I... I'm, I'm sort of speaking theoretically. Gotcha. Uh, the, um, you know, for, for young kids under, you know, under, under a certain age, the reality is, is they're, they're, they're only going to eat things that you give them. Mm -hmm. So, so I'd recommend parents, like while kids are very young, 
there's no need to be giving them Christmas cookies. There's no need to be giving them candy because they're going to get hooked on that and they're going to want it more. And if and if they don't know it exists, they're they're never going to know. So so I mean, those are kids. That's underage, you know, three, four, something like that. Once they start getting social, so um, you know th- that that would be the first thing is you know is that it, eventually a hungry hun- a hungry kid will eat and that will become their new normal. And when you set that as the new normal, that you you are. Just like you teach a kid to brush their teeth, mm-hmm. right? We say, okay, I know that you might not like it in the moment, um, but you gotta brush your teeth. If, if being healthy becomes the default behavior in the household, yeah. it's, just, it's just something that you do. You don't have to force it, it's just something that you do. Yeah, and I look at kids today, it's so hard with the, for lack of another term, what I call the corn syrup diet these days. Yeah. Uh, behavior problems, sleep problems, immune system problems, all directly traceable right back to diet that if we can make a difference in the child's diet almost from day one, which to me day one is keep them breastfeeding, uh, and I don't have kids as well, this is what we've been looking into, keep them breastfeeding yeah. for, for quite yeah. a while. Right. And then you can make a, a, and then the longer you can keep them on a diet that they're not exposed to what the Joneses are having down the road, um, ripples through massively. It's 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 logarithmic for the health of their entire life. Not just their health, but their yep. mental well-being and their success as well because they can yep. think more clearly. Yep, couldn't agree more. So let's jump from from kids. Then, um, what would be three key takeaway pieces of advice? that you would give everyone out there? Well, um, you know, for, first of all, don't, you know, don't focus on things in terms of a diet. Really, really focus on the lifestyle. Um, and uh, it, there are, uh, being healthy is more, uh, you know, about more than what you eat. So right now, I've done this whole interview standing up. I'm at a standing desk. I there, are little, there are little simple ways throughout your day that you can become a more active, a more active person. So, um, so one would be, uh, you know, find a way to stand up more, get a standing desk. You don't have to buy one. You can just put a crate, you know, or a, or a small box on, on top of a table, um, and that works. Um, uh, tr- you know, try a, try some cold exposure. Try a cold plunge, and you know, maybe after a sauna or something hot. Um, the, I mean, those are just sort of fun. And, and don't neglect the fact, uh, you know, seeking out pe- other people who are healthy and surrounding yourself with them. It makes it much easier to make changes in your own life when you have other people that you're hanging out with who are making the same choices. Cause that that makes perfect sense. And you, you're talking about being active, moving more, something we really didn't get to dive into much in this yeah. interview. But if, if those around you are active and mobile, Mobile, new word, and, <laughs> and moving, you're lo- more likely to do the same things. Yeah, totally, totally. We're we're social animals. So that would that would be number one. No, it's number two. Uh, yeah. So n- number one, community. Uh, number two, um, you know, there may be moments in your life when you change jobs or you move or something like that, and those right after you do that can be a great time to create new habits Mm -hmm. uh, because because we have old habits and a lot of habits are associated with physical places and specific people and you know for for example uh smokers find it's easier to quit uh, when they switch jobs or when they move so uh, use those uh moments as an opportunity to create some new habits um and the third a, a third thing would be uh think about and I list some of these ideas in my book, but think about things you can do um, that don't require discipline. You know, changes to your habitat, if you will, your sort of, your zoo habitat um, that don't require discipline. So the lighting in your, in your bedroom, uh, you know, getting blue blocker glasses uh, to filter out the blue light. We didn't get to talk about this whole lot, but um, those are the types of things where, you know, you can have as much discipline as you want but if you're still shining all this bright 
blue light on you, it's going to screw up your circadian rhythm and it's going to be hard to sleep. So but if you after, do, after uh, sunset here, and I tend to take a walk at sunset each evening, I try to keep the electronics down and then yeah. at a certain hour, they're, they're completely off, which, you know, when you run your own business, you have your own show, you're wanting to check, you're wanting to check. Yeah. But you have to, I, I find, I have to unplug from what I call artificial light. Yep. If I'm going to be able to wind down and get a good night's rest. And yes, and part of that is discipline. But part of that, you can, you can set up your life, your habitat in such a way that you're less likely to get that artificial light. Uh, getting artificial lights out of your bedroom. Mm -hmm. um, in, you know, installing flux and some other things on your laptop, on your phone, things like that. Getting the blue blocker glasses. Because once, with many of those things, once you do them, it doesn't require ongoing discipline to keep doing. So I love finding things where I can just make one change once and boom, I get the effect of it, whether I'm being lazy or whether I'm not being lazy. I love so, it. And, so, and you've uh, got me thinking now blue blockers. And I was looking at them the last time I ordered glasses. And I didn't because I realized I'd be wearing like my glasses all the time. But yeah. you can you can get, um, which actually I've rolled back my prescription over fifty percent. Wow. Um, so so I went from like a five five fifty to a, a one seventy five two fifty. So that's incredible. Um, so you can uh, all of the well you know we're amazingly adaptable creatures once we get away from the comfort habits that weaken us. Right. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 exactly right. You know, we've we got to make things a little bit tougher, and and we'll be we'll be better off for it. We're robust. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're, we are we are wild animals. You know, we 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 got to wake up that that beast inside. Woohoo! Woohoo! So, uh, where can people go to find out more and uh, to find your book? Yeah. So. Uh, you know, you can you can get the Paleo Manifesto on Amazon or BNN. Uh, that that's just the best place to do it. Um, and I, you know, that's that's really the best statement of of who I am and you know what this is all about. Um, yeah. I, I haven't been blogging a whole lot recently, but you know, some of the other other uh, companies that I'm helping is ThriveMarket.com. So so check them out. You can get a month free uh, before paying any a annual membership. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, and, and then I'm on Twitter at John Durant, J O H N D U R A N T, but I tweet about all sorts of stuff. So beware. And, and we'll, and what we'll do is we'll take these links and we'll put them on our website so that if you, if you know, you're driving along and you can't get all of these, just go to inspire nation show and, and we'll have, uh, we'll have thrive. We'll have your, your website. We'll have your, your Twitter on there as well. well maybe with a little warning. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I comment, evolution is, is, a, is a window into human nature, and mm -hmm. so that's a, that's a pretty big platform. So I, I, I'll comment on all sorts of stuff from health and fitness to sports to sex and dating to politics to things like that. Fascinating. Awesome. I love it. Great. Well, thank you. This, this was a blast. Uh, it, was, it was great to see you uh, after a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, glad to see that you're doing well. Um, We'll say hello to Jessica for me. Will do. Thank you so much, John. For everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, ask what would caveman do, and shine bright. Woohoo! Woo! <laughs> Thank you so much, John. Thank you. That was a blast. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>